just as the truth of God's sovereign election stands opposed to the notion that man's responsibility alone accounts for sinners coming to Christ in faith, just as that is true, it is also true that that phrase, the rest were blinded, stands opposed to the notion that man's responsibility alone accounts for those sinners who do not come to Christ in faith. In other words, it is not man's responsibility alone that accounts for either. The text is clearly teaching us that. The title of our sermon this morning, The Remnant and the Rest, Romans chapter 11, verses 7 through 10. So this morning now, we're continuing our our study of Paul's letter to the church at Rome. And in this section of Paul's letter, Paul is concerned with the apostasy and unbelief of the vast majority of his Jewish brethren. While a small remnant remains, the larger portion of the nation of Israel, a nation that had enjoyed untold blessings and covenant with God, The larger portion of that nation is now languishing in sin, languishing in rebellion. They have rejected their promised Messiah. They stand opposed to the preaching of the gospel and they are destined for eternal torment under the judgment of God. Paul knows it and it's breaking Paul's heart. Far from indicating that God has somehow abandoned the covenant that he made with Abraham, far from indicating somehow that the word of God has has failed, Paul, on the contrary, magnifies the mercy and grace of God in sparing a remnant. Paul magnifies the faithfulness of God to his decreed purpose. Paul magnifies the faithfulness of God to his promise by saving a remnant according to what Paul calls the election of grace. Far from unbelieving Israel somehow indicating God's failure, it is the very presence of a believing remnant that magnifies his faithfulness, that magnifies his grace, that magnifies God's mercy. Thus says the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, says the Lord. God is infinitely, eternally, eminently faithful to his word. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. He will not cast them off or shove them aside. That grace and mercy, that faithfulness, that love is certainly not owing to anything in or about them. That grace and mercy is exclusively owing to the eternal counsels of God's own infinite mind. It is exclusively owing to God's determination to set his love upon a distinguished people. God foreknew them. God in eternity determined to set his distinguishing love upon them. And for his own sovereign good pleasure, he has foreknown them, he has predestined them, he has effectually called them to himself, he has justified them, he has glorified them. All through faith alone, in his son. And the rest, the rest of reprobate Israel sought a justifying righteousness with God through works of the law. (laughs) These, the remnant, received a justifying righteousness as the gift of God through faith, even the righteousness of Jesus Christ through faith alone apart from works. And not only from among the Jews, but from among the nations as well. And you and I, brothers and sisters this morning, are an exemplar of that. We are a testimony of that truth. Their very existence, the very existence of that remnant is owing all to grace. I say then, verse one, has God cast away his people? Absolutely not. Certainly not. God forbid, may it never be. God, verse two, has not shoved to the side those whom he foreknew because God is faithful to his word. God is faithful to his promises. God has been faithful to his covenant with Abraham. So then now, as before, we see a distinction that is being made by God. A distinction that is made between the mass of fallen Israel and the remnant. A distinction made by God between the reprobate and the elect. 
And it is the sovereign determination of God alone that serves as the basis for that distinction. It is not owing to anything in the sinner. It's a distinction between the remnant and the rest. It is God's determination, God's sovereign will, God's decreed purpose that distinguishes between Paul's countrymen according to the flesh and the spiritual seed of Abraham through the faith of believing Abraham. It is God's determination, God's sovereign will that distinguishes the physical descendants of Abraham from the spiritual descendants of Abraham, from the 7,000 in the days of Elijah and the rest of unbelieving Israel. God's sovereign determination is the basis for the distinction between Isaac and Ishmael. God's sovereign determination is the distinction, is the basis for the distinction between Jacob and Esau, between the vessels of mercy prepared beforehand for glory and the vessels of wrath prepared beforehand for destruction. That's what the word of God teaches. It was God's sovereign determination that accounts for the difference between the vessels of honor and the vessels of dishonor, between those whom he effectually calls to himself and those whom he hardens. And it is God's sovereign determination that accounts for the difference between the mass of physical temporal theocratic Israel according to the flesh and that believing remnant whom he foreknew who would be saved eternally through faith in his son. Who makes you to differ from another? Who makes you to differ? It is the grace of God. It is owing entirely to the grace of God. God's foreknowledge does not fail. God's eternal purpose, God's decreed will cannot be thwarted. And God's electing grace is found to be decisively demonstrated in the salvation of Paul himself and in the salvation of 7,000 in the days of Elijah. And brothers and sisters, in the salvation of you and I, God is faithful to his promise. God is faithful to his word. So having emphasized then the presence of that remnant as a testimony of God's gracious election, God's faithfulness to his word, Paul now turns in Romans chapter 11, verse seven, to address the present condition of apostate, unbelieving, and reprobate Israel. Just as Paul has effectively demonstrated a divine election, Paul now also speaks of a divine reprobation. Verse seven, What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Just as it is written, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, ears that they should not hear to this very day. And David says, Let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bow down their back always. It's not an easy read, is it? (laughs) Not an easy read. God pouring out his judgment upon them. God judicially hardening them. God in judgment blinding them. David praying that they would not see. Their condition, their eternal destiny, certainly not outside the determination of God, but rather their condition, their eternal destiny in keeping with the determination of God. For many, that's not an easy read, but that is certainly what the Bible is saying. This text addresses precisely those truths. And brothers and sisters, this is where verse-by-verse exposition compels us to consider the whole counsel of God. You can't turn away a blind eye, a deaf ear, to the truth of God revealed in his word. You can come to texts like this this morning, submitting yourself to a process that will lead you to authorial intent. Right? You can submit yourself to the word of God. God, I wanna know what you say, and I wanna know what you mean by what you say. You can submit your heart You can bend the knee, if you will, to God's revealed word. How am I to understand this in context? What am I to know about him? Or you can turn a blind, illogical, 
irrational, even cowardly eye toward texts like this and allow your own logic, your own supposed wisdom, your own faulty presuppositions to act as judge over God's words and God's actions. I would submit to you that many, many, many do the latter rather than the former. What does God's word say? What does God reveal about himself? How are we to understand these things? What does God mean by what God says? Rather than arguing in the text, arguing with the text, begin by submitting yourself to the text and then trying to figure out what he's talking about, right? We have what God has given us. We have what he has revealed to us. We have to take him at his word and then reconcile that with how we are to understand it. We have to come to authorial intent. The way to avoid gross error is exegetical and theological precision with the text. That's why good exegesis and good theology is so important. We have to mix that with a humble submission from the heart to the revealed word of God. What the word of God teaches, I wanna be a card carrying, devoted follower of exactly what God has revealed, right? That should be the heart, your heart as well. That's the heart of a Christian. What are you saying, Lord? What are you teaching? I want to believe and follow that. What is God himself communicating to us in this text? We can't be self-willed with the Bible, amen? We cannot be self-willed with the Bible. And we can't make excuses with the Bible. These things are disagreed upon by, no. What does the text say? Why? Why do so many disagree with the clear proclamation of the word of God? Because they let their own presuppositions, their own logic get in the way of what God is revealing. And what God is revealing is infinite wisdom, not man's wisdom. So stop applying man's wisdom to your understanding of the word of God. Let God speak to you from his word and teach you something, right? We're here as learners of God's word. We're here to be taught I'm always amazed that um, I, to my shame, I've done this too, right? I'm always amazed at how many times people, people look for a church based upon whether that church agrees with them or not. We're in the position to learn from the Bible. So find a church that teaches verse by verse, word by word through the Bible and learn. Own it for yourself. Right? We're not going to compel you at the point of a spear to believe something that the word of God doesn't teach. But when we come to you with the word of God, you have, to, you have it in your hands. Examine it for yourself. Look at it. Don't be self-willed. Don't puff yourself up in pride with what you think you already know. Come as a humble Berean and learn from God. And as you learn, you can own theology for yourself. You can understand it for yourself and see if these things are not so. Amen? We're to be good Bereans with the word of God. Now, as Paul, in light of all that, as Paul has done before, in consideration of Paul's Jewish objectors, Paul himself now turns to the authoritative text of the Old Testament again to make his case. And he begins with his case in verse seven. What then? What are we to conclude from all that has been said about the present state of ethnic Jews? Paul's countrymen, according to the flesh. What are we to conclude? Verse seven, Israel has not obtained what it seeks. Well, what was it that Israel sought after that Israel did not attain? Chapter nine, verse 31. Israel pursuing a justifying righteousness through works of the law has not attained to that righteousness which they sought. That's what Israel did not attain. Israel has not obtained what it seeks. They did not seek it through faith in God's son. Rather, they sought it through their own merit. They sought it through their own works and they stumbled at, they, at that stumbling stone. They have stumbled over Christ himself. And God says, all day long, he has stretched out his gracious hands to a disobedient and contrary people. God has not been miserly with his revelation to them. Verse seven, so Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but... In distinction to physical ethnic Israel, the elect have obtained it. 
They have obtained to a justifying righteousness. All those who have been foreknown, predestined, called, justified, glorified, an elect remnant made up of elect Jews and elect Gentiles, an elect remnant who are the spiritual seed of Abraham and heirs according to the promise, they have obtained to that justifying righteousness. And they've obtained to that justifying righteousness through the means that God himself has appointed. Namely, through faith alone, in Christ alone, apart from any works of their own. Notice with me. It's impossible, impossible to ignore in this text the married realities of God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. You cannot ignore either one. It is impossible. God elects. God determines. God makes a distinction. God initiates. God works. God saves. And at the very same time, we see an emphasis on Israel's failure, don't we? They are responsible. Israel refused. Israel stumbled. Israel persists in obstinate unbelief. Israel persists in disobedience to the gospel. And it's a fact for which Israel will be held ultimately accountable. Nevertheless, God's sovereignty, man's responsibility, married together, you can't ignore either. Nevertheless, in consideration now of Israel's present condition, Paul turns back to the sovereignty of God to explain it. The sovereign will of God, the decreed will of God is the determining cause in the distinction that is made between unbelieving Israel and the remnant, between the remnant and the rest. Verse seven, what then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it and the rest were blinded. The word there for blinded means hardened. It's the same meaning, right? Same semantic range. It means or it refers to someone being rendered insensible. They're insensible. Now notice the passive voice. They were blinded. This is what we call a divine passive. You have the remnant and you have all the rest. The rest of Israel, those not among the remnant whom God has chosen to himself, they are the passive objects of a judicial act of God whereby they were blinded. Do you see? Now think with me, think with me. Just as the biblical truth of a sovereign election of grace Just as that truth stands opposed to the notion that man's responsibility alone accounts for sinners turning to Christ in faith, so too the truth that the rest were blinded stands opposed to the notion that man's responsibility alone accounts for those sinners who do not turn to Christ in faith. I want to say that again. I think it's it's important we understand that particular point from the text. Just as the truth of God's sovereign election stands opposed to the notion that man's responsibility alone accounts for sinners coming to Christ in faith. Just as that is true, it is also true that that phrase, the rest were blinded, stands opposed to the notion that man's responsibility alone accounts for those sinners who do not come to Christ in faith. In other words, it is not man's responsibility alone that accounts for either. The text is clearly teaching us that. Just as God determines in grace and mercy to save a remnant, so too God determines to act in righteous judgment upon men for their sin. Men are responsible to God for their sin against them. Men are responsible for their unbelief. But for those who are perishing, even in this life, they face the righteous retribution of God for their sin. Romans chapter one, verse 18. Again, we flesh out more of what this text, Romans 1, 18 is saying. The wrath of God is presently being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And I would submit to you that the wrath of God is presently being revealed against the un- ungodliness and unrighteousness of men in this particular way. Verse seven, the elect have obtained it 
by the sovereign determination of God in grace, and the rest were blinded by the sovereign determination of God in justice. In other words, their continuing unbelief, their continuing rebellion is the fruit of God's justice, is the fruit of God's judicial act. It is the fruit of God's sovereign will and determined purpose. The rest were blinded. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. Do not be deceived. God is not aloof, far off, turning a blind eye to your sin. God will act in judgment. He will pour out his wrath. He will recompense. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. Therefore, chapter nine, verse 18, he has mercy on whom he wills and whom he wills, he hardens, he blinds, he judges, vessels of wrath prepared beforehand for destruction. See, the point of that is this, human responsibility, human responsibility is not set aside by this sovereign determination of God. And brothers and sisters, the sovereign determination of God cannot be set aside by human responsibility. Rather, human responsibility for sin is upheld by this sovereign determination of God. God wills and God acts in righteous judgment. God's judgments are just. God is vindicated in his judgments. God is vindicated in his judicial acts upon sinful men. Paul refers to a remnant according to the election of grace. Dr. Martin refers to all the rest according to the rejection of wrath. To which group do you belong? To which group do you belong this morning? Are you among those whom God has called to himself in grace? Or are you among those who persist in their sin? Are you among those in whom God is actively working by his spirit? Or are you among those who have not truly turned to Christ in genuine repentant faith and are persisting in disobedience to the gospel? You're here, many of you here week after week, you've heard the gospel. Week after week in this place, are you going to continue to persist in your disobedience to the gospel? Are you going to continue to persist in unbelief? God acts in retribution. God will not be mocked. Whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. God acts in justice. Having described the remnant, Paul now describes the rest in verse eight. And he does so from two related texts to make this case. Verse eight, just as it is written, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear to this very day. Turn with me to Isaiah 29. First of these references from Isaiah 29. Isaiah 29 and also Deuteronomy 29. We'll look at that in a moment. A portion of this reference comes from a proclamation of judgment against Jerusalem by the prophet Isaiah. Think with me now. God has given them his word and they continue to sin against him. God has sent messengers to proclaim it to them, right? Rising up early and sending them. They've had privileges from God, such blessings, such light from God. They've had the very oracles of God given to them. And yet, verse nine, pause and wonder. Blind yourselves and be blind. They've had all this light. They've had all this revelation. They've had the, the grace and mercy of God given to them on a silver platter, but they are drunk, verse nine, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with intoxicating drink. It's as though they have no concern for the judgment of God that hangs over their head. It's as though they have turned a blind eye, they've turned a deaf ear to the judgment of God, to the proclamation of his word. Verse 10, because, this is because, verse 10, 
the Lord has poured out on you the spirit of deep sleep. He has closed your eyes, namely the prophets, and he has covered your heads, namely the seers. In other words, God has poured out upon them a judicial stupor, a judicial blinding, such that they are spiritually stacking around like a drunkard. The blind leading the blind. Their prophets are blind. Their seers can't see. It's the blind leading the blind. Verse 11, the whole vision has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one another, one who is literate, saying, read this, please. And that literate one says, I cannot, for it is sealed. In other words, the word of God has become useless to you. It's become useless. Why is that? God is letting them in on a mystery here. They don't see it. They don't hear it. They don't get it because the Lord has poured out upon them a spirit of deep sleep. The Lord has closed their eyes. The Lord has covered their heads. This book, verse 12, has delivered one who is illiterate saying, read this please. And he says, I'm not literate. I can't understand it. The word of God, the proclamation of God, his proclamation of judgment against them is useless to them. They don't get it. They can't hear it. Therefore, the Lord has said, inasmuch as these people draw near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me, their fear toward me is taught by the commandments of men. Therefore, in judgment upon them, in a judicial act of hardening. God says, behold, I will again do a marvelous work among this people, a marvelous work and a wonder for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish and, their un and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hidden, hidden from them. They hear the words of Isaiah, but they do not hear them. Right? They perceive with their eyes, but they do not see. Verse 15, woe to those who seek deep to hide their counsel far from the Lord and their works are in the dark. They say, who sees us and who knows us? Surely you have things turned around. Shall the potter be esteemed as the clay? For shall the thing made say of him who made it, he did not make me? Or shall the thing formed say of him who formed it, he has no understanding? Paul references this text in Romans chapter 11, verse eight, to describe the mass of apostate Israel in his own day. He's using this as a description of the Jews in his own day. In fact, this text, the text of Isaiah 29, referenced multiple times in the New Testament to describe the Jews. God has poured out an undeserved judgment upon them? An unrighteous judgment upon them? No. God has poured out upon them his judicial retribution. God has poured out upon them a righteous judgment and their failure to hear, their failure to see is the fruit of, is the consequence of their apostasy. The judgment of God upon their unbelief. Their rejection of Jesus Christ, their Messiah, is the judgment of God upon them such that the loving pleas of Paul will fall for many on deaf ears. Just as it is written, Romans chapter 11, verse eight, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, ears that they should not hear to this very day. It's not too complicated, is it? When we work through the text, what God is saying and what God means by what he is saying. Now, the second part of that reference in Romans 11, verse eight, comes to us from the words of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 29. Turn there with me. Deuteronomy 29, where Moses addresses the children of Israel in verse two. Right? The emancipation generation has died in the wilderness. Their corpses strewn in the dirt of the desert. It's Moses now, before they go in or attempt to go in a second time, Moses calls all of Israel to himself 
Deuteronomy 29, verse two, and he says to them, you have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land. You saw it with your own eyes. The great trials which your eyes have seen, the signs, those great wonders, you saw that with your own eyes. Yet, verse four, for all that, for those wonders done before your very eyes, the Lord has not given you a heart to perceive and eyes to see and ears to hear to this very day. Have you ever thought to yourself, if we were back in Israel, back in Jerusalem, in the days of the Lord Jesus Christ, when the Lord Jesus Christ were, was performing miracles on the Temple Mount, and we saw a withered hand with our own eyes, we saw a withered hand restored. We saw a dead man raised to life. If we saw the Lord Jesus Christ himself raised from the dead, certainly, who wouldn't believe? The host of apostate Israel wouldn't believe. The rich man in Lazarus. The rich man is in hell. Father Abraham, come dip your finger in the water and touch my tongue, cool. My tongue in this, I'm in torment in these flames. Father Abraham, send my brothers to preach, lest anyone, let any of them come to this place of torment. What is Abraham? Tell them, they have Moses and the prophets. They have Moses and the prophets. If they won't believe Moses and the prophets, neither will they believe the one were raised from the dead. That's a shout out to the Lord Jesus Christ who is risen from the dead and people to this day reject him. It's astonishing. He has been raised from the dead. Those apostles went right back into Jerusalem and preached something they knew to be true to their own deaths. And we have their eyewitness testimony. And yet people will not believe. It's amazing. Israel, Deuteronomy 29, had been delivered from their bondage in Egypt. God had worked wonders in their sight. God had made his presence to dwell in their midst. They heard his voice on the mountain. They saw him in the flame of fire. He gave them his holy law. And before Israel had ever taken the first step away from Sinai toward the promised land, they made for themselves a golden calf and committed idolatry. Turned aside to idols. God cares for them in the wilderness. Water from the rock, bread out of heaven. And they halted, they halted in unbelief at Kadesh Barnea. The entire emancipation generation coming out of Egypt died in the wilderness. And now they stand at the border of Canaan in Deuteronomy 29. Moses has reminded them of God's law, reminded them of all that God had done in their sight. And he says to them, you are blind, deaf, and dumb to this day. And that is why. What is the reason that Moses gives them? Because God has not given them a heart to perceive and eyes to see and ears to hear to this very day. Reconcile that with your Arminianism. <laughs> As judgment upon them for their rebellion, God has withheld from them illuminating grace. And that is the judgment of God. That is a judicial act. That is the justice, the unflinching, unwavering, uncompromising justice of God. And if your sins are not going to be paid for by the person and work of Jesus Christ alone, then you one day will come face to face with that unwavering, unflinching, uncompromising justice of God. God has withheld from them his illuminating grace as a judicial act. However, if you think about this with me too, in the midst of that, in the midst of that reality, that truth, in all that we deserve, in all that Israel deserves, there is hope. And why is there hope? Because of the astonishing, staggering grace and mercy of God. In the midst of this judgment, God does not withhold from them hope of repentance and hope of pardon. Verse 10, Deuteronomy 29, verse 10. 
All of you stand today before the Lord your God, Moses says. Your leaders and your tribes and your elders and your officers, all the men of Israel, don't flee. Your little ones, boys and girls, your wives, the stranger who is in your camp, the one who cuts your wood to the one who draws your water, stand before the Lord your God. Do not flee so that, verse 12, you may enter into covenant with the Lord your God and enter into his oath which the Lord your God makes with you today so that he may establish you today as a people for himself and that he may be God to you just as he has spoken to you and just as he has sworn to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amazing, astonishing grace and mercy. God intends to save a people for his name. God intends to lavish upon them his grace and his goodness and his mercy. And as long as God intends to do that, seek him while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Call upon him through the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved, be forgiven of your sin. God is merciful. He delights to show mercy and he is mighty to save. And just as that word, right? Just as that word of God's mercy, of God's grace, of God's covenant blessings, of God's promises, just as that word is a word of hope to those who would turn to Jesus Christ in faith and be saved, at the same time, it is a legal testimony against those who would reject it. It, is, it has legal significance, legal ramifications for those who would rebel against God and turn, live for themselves in rebellion against him. It is a word of hope to those who will turn in faith and be saved from the wrath to come. And it is a word through which many may repent and believe. And at the same time, that word will be a means of justice to those who reject it. Now from Moses and Isaiah, Paul then turns to the prayer of David, to a prayer of David in Romans chapter 11, verse nine. Romans eleven nine, 9, David then says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bow down their back always. That comes to us from Psalm 69. Turn there with me, Psalm 69. Hang in there with me. Psalm 69 is considered an imprecatory psalm. It's a psalm of imprecation. And the psalmist David prays here, the psalmist David prays that God would visit judgment upon his enemies. That's what David is praying. David is praying that God would visit judgment upon his enemies. However, in addition to being an imprecatory psalm, Psalm 69 is also a messianic psalm. So we are right to consider these words on the lips of our Lord Jesus Christ. The New Testament references this prayer as one on the heart and mind of the crucified Christ. Look there at verse seven. Because for your sake, I have borne reproach, the psalmist says. Shame has covered my face I have become a stranger to my brothers. I have become an alien to my mother's children. He came to his own, his own received him not. Mm -hmm. Because zeal for your house has eaten me up and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen upon me. When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that became my reproach. I also made sackcloth my garment. I became a byword to them. The insults that they heaped upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who sit at the gate speak against me and I am the song of drunkards. You know, verse 19, verse 19. You know my reproach, my shame, my dishonor. My adversaries are all before you. Reproach has broken my heart. I am full of heaviness. I looked for someone to take pity, but there was none. I looked for comforters, but I found none. They also gave me gall for my food, and for my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. What insults, right? What mocking. Verse 22. 
Let their table become a snare before them. Let their well-being become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see. Make their loins shake continually. Pour out your indignation upon them. Let your wrathful anger take hold of them. Let their dwelling place be desolate. Let no one live in their tents, for they persecute the ones you have struck and talk of the grief of those you have wounded. Add iniquity to their iniquity. Let them not come into your righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. The New Testament quotes this psalm multiple times of the Lord Jesus Christ. These are not only David's words. These are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, praying for God to judge those who have hated him without cause. These are a people who sin with impunity. In the face of what Jesus Christ has done, delivering up his body voluntarily in death, shedding his own blood for unworthy, undeserving sinners, in the face of that, They mock. They count the blood of the covenant a common thing, something to be trampled underfoot. They do that in their rejection. There hangs the Lord Jesus Christ in infamy. For sinners, he is slain. And will you reject him? Will you reject such acts of love? Will you reject such offers of grace and mercy? Will you count that sacrifice a common thing? Will you see it as nothing in your sight? What impunity, with what impunity do they reject him? Do they mock him? Do you see? They believe that they feast in safety doing that. Their table becomes a snare. They believe that they are secure. They will face the judgment of God who is a consuming fire. Their well-being will close in on them like a trap. The truth of God is before their eyes. The truth of God is in their hands. It is in your hands this morning. And he prays, let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see. Visit them with a judicial blindness. Rain down justice upon them. Do not allow them to escape. Blot them out of the book of the living. That is what awaits all of those who reject the Lord Jesus Christ. There are many in this world who've never heard the gospel. We can't say that in our country. And I'm often amazed. We sometimes think, Well, they just haven't heard it. They haven't preached it. They haven't heard it preached. They haven't heard it clearly. And yet, you listen to their songs and their mocking refrains about Jesus Christ. They blaspheme. They go about in their adultery and their fornication and their lust and their anger and whatever it is, that course of debauchery wearing a cross around their neck. They're not ignorant. They know And what is visited upon them is a judicial blindness. The only way that judicial blindness is lifted is if God lifts his hand of judgment from upon them in grace and in mercy and gives them a heart to perceive, gives them eyes to see, gives them ears to hear. Who makes you to differ from another? God, the grace of God. The Jews of Paul's day are among those enemies of David who reproached the Lord Jesus Christ. This prayer of imprecation applies to them. And this prayer is attributed to the son of God himself in the New Testament. Romans chapter 11, verse nine, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. That recompense, speaking of God's righteous retribution, let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bow down their back always. Literally, bend them out of shape, right? Literally, that they would be crushed under the weight of his wrath. In the words of the psalm, pour out your indignation upon them. Let your wrathful anger take hold of them. There will come a day in answer to this prayer 
when the enemies of the Lord Jesus Christ will be crushed under the weight of his wrath and God will be righteous in doing it. In Revelation chapter 18, when the whore of Babylon is cast down, the people of God are told, rejoice over her, rejoice over her, O heaven, you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. Revelation chapter 19, verse one. After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, hallelujah. When the wicked are judged, the people of God cry out, hallelujah. Salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. He has avenged her blood of his servants shed by her has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Again, they said, hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever and ever, the smoke of her torment. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sat on the throne saying, amen, hallelujah. Then a voice came from the throne saying, praise our God, all you his servants and those who fear him, both small and great And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude and the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thundering saying, hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Amen and amen. Paul references this sentiment in Romans chapter 11, verses seven through 10. Then he references the prayer in Psalm 69, And he applies that truth to the Jews. It's a reality that applies to all those who reject Jesus Christ in unbelief. Their rejection is not somehow outside the parameters of God's determined will, God's sovereign will. As long as God's hand of judgment remains upon them, their very rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ is an indication of that judgment. Their rejection is an indication that they are blind Their rejection is an an indication that they are deaf. It is an irrational response to turn a deaf ear to the gospel. God has given them a spirit of stupor. But as long as there is the gracious and merciful proclamation of the gospel, which takes place throughout this age, there will come an end, Revelation 11, this evening, there will come an end to the testimony of the Lord's church. When that testimony comes to an end, the end will come. And Jesus Christ, in victory, will judge the wicked. But as long as that proclamation of the gospel remains, there is hope that God will lift his hand of judgment and save. Paul remains hopeful regarding the future of his countrymen according to the flesh. He remains hopeful about the Jews. He's going to discuss that in verse 11 and following. We'll get into that next time. God spares a remnant according to the election of grace and the rest were blinded. By a judicial act of divine wrath, God himself renders them insensible to the proclamation of the gospel. What do we know? What do we know that is true about this condition? This condition that Paul describes. What do we know about it? We know that apart from that gracious outpouring of God's mercy, that men grow harder and harder and harder. They don't become more and more sensible apart from God's grace. They become harder and harder and harder. As long as you continue to persist in your sin, you have every, every expectation to think, every expectation to believe that you will grow harder and harder, blinder and blinder. Hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, your conscience seared as with a hot iron, your continued rejection, a further indication of God's divine judgment against your sin. Storing up for yourselves, in the language of Romans chapter two, storing up for yourselves wrath in the day of wrath and the righteous and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. To the one who supposes that he may You've heard many people say this, right? To the one who supposes that on his deathbed, I'll turn to God. At some point in the future, I'll turn to him. What a fool. What a fool. God has poured out upon you a spirit of stupor. To the one who sits under the gracious preaching of his word, 
week in and week out and, and refuses to turn at his reproof. What a fool. What a fool. You think you dwell safely. Your table has become a snare. Your well-being, your comfort, your leisure has become to you a trap. You're walking through this life in a deep sleep. It is time you wake up. Wake up. Do you have any sight of him at all? I would imagine that if you're here, you do. Do you have any sight of him at all? Do you hear anything at all? His entreaties to you in the gospel? I would think that you do if you're here. Humble yourself. Turn while you still can. Give up living life for yourself. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And may God have mercy upon you. How long do you expect God to be patient with you in your rebellion? Brothers and sisters, in light of this, beware growing comfortable. Beware growing complacent. Beware a cooling zeal. Beware a dull heart. Beware an insensitivity to your sin. Beware an insensitivity to his word. Beware a rebellious spirit to his preaching and teaching. Beware a growing death. The path to apostasy is progressive, you see. We are to cling to him who is our life. Do not flee. Stand before the Lord your God. Cling to him in faith, amen? And he is mighty to save. Pray with me. Father in heaven, Lord, in our own sight, make yourself our fear. Help us, Lord, to see you as you are, to see us as we are, to understand, to perceive with our heart, to see with our eyes, to hear with our ears. I pray, Lord, that you would give us understanding, that you would illumine our hearts and minds by your spirit. You would lead us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. For those here, Lord, unconverted, I pray, open blind eyes, unstop deaf ears, and give them a new heart. Indwell them with your spirit. Cause them to hear and to see and to walk in your statutes and judgments and to keep them. Only you, Lord, can do that work. We depend upon you. We cry out to you for it. Be merciful, O oh God, for the sake of your great name, for the sake that you delight to show mercy. Be merciful to us. We love you. We thank you for these precious truths, your precious promises, your precious word, your steadfast faithfulness. We praise you and thank you that as long as the gospel is proclaimed, there is hope in Jesus Christ for the salvation, for salvation from our sins, for pardon, for eternal life in union with him. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. We're so grateful that you've connected with us through the sermon that you've just heard. For more information, visit us at cornerstoneorlando.org. Or better yet, come and see us on the Lord's Day at 3370 Snow Hill Road in Oviedo, Florida. We're just east of Orlando and about 15 minutes from the campus at UCF. It would be a joy to have you worship with us.